good evening a warm welcome from our program the international strategic and uh, security studies uh, within nias a few months ago in this hall we have launched this uh, new initiative within ipsp uh, we call it as international peace research initiative ipri uh, supported by a german foundation konrad adenauer stiftung as a part of this ipri activities we have uh, formed a, a huge uh, network of uh, colleges and universities uh, working on uh, peace and uh, conflict related issues at the global level as a part of this program we also have what we call as the peace lecture series so we have been doing uh, we have done in the last 6 months two lectures peace lectures uh, as a part of this series and today's lecture uh, we are doing it as a part of uh, gandhi at 150 uh, india at 70 Uh, we are planning to have at least two or three lectures because this being the 150th birthday of of uh, birth year of, of Mahatma Gandhi, we thought it would be useful to see uh, Gandhi 150 years and India 70 years. Technically not 70 years, 72 years, but then looking at how where we figure in terms of Gandhi and our independence. And when I approached uh, Professor Pani uh, to give the first lecture under this series, you know, in India at 70 and Gandhi at 150, he readily agreed. and then he suggested this this title gandhi peace and post truth uh, quite a intriguing uh, title maybe he will be able to explain it to you better uh, i'll before i request uh, professor uh, uh, pani this we are planning to put it on online as a as i to plus three podcast so that it invites a global audience uh, when professor pani asked me what could he speak on uh, then i went and googled to search what are the recent uh, seminars or dialogues on gandhi and i was surprised to see some 100 pages uh, multiple universities holding uh, debates and dialogues on gandhi uh, having centers on gandhi uh, i was really surprised to see the audience you know there are multiple uh, uh, outreach programs on gandhi lectures then i realized perhaps you know this lecture needs a, a larger audience so we'll uh, we'll put it on online sir with uh, with uh, permission from you and also we are planning to bring it as a small report at a later stage uh, with that introduction let me invite professor pani to you over to you sir thank you uh, professor chandran and, th- and thank you for all for being here uh, th- as uh, so was just pointing out this is uh, uh, the 150th year and 150th year you're going to get a lot of of lot of uh, talks and other elements on gandhi and the main thrust of this is typically i think they would tend to fall into two broad categories the first category is those that that look at gandhi per se his life and what he did during it and and there are and there is a, a large amount of literature still there uh, in fact the new york times in a review of ram guha's book last month uh was just just went into the whole issue of how gandhi's life still generates fresh autobiography or fresh biographies and how that was something that uh, very few lives in the world have actually managed to generate the kind of biographies and each one quite distinct and quite new in in its own way the second stream and which i hope will become a little more prominent than has been so far is a stream that looks at gandhi's ideas on these methods and sees where that is leading us and this is something that uh, i would mention because uh, interpreting gandhi can be very difficult for a simple reason that uh, his methods of communication were through practice so if he said his life is his message it's extremely personalized and they tend to get into personal traits personal experiments and what he did and what he did not do in the process some of the more significant elements of his thought for instance what was the method he used to look at indian society that enabled him to to generate the largest political movement of the 20th century in terms of numbers there are other movements like lenin's or or um, or mao zedong's which have a uh, arguably equally or more uh, more effective or more uh, dramatic in their impact but uh, in terms of sheer numbers very few people generated the kind of of numbers that that he did and that could not have been done without a particular understanding of society of politics when he takes on 
the entire British Empire by walking up to Gandhi and picking up a hand, fistful of salt. There's no sense of understanding why did he think it'll work, right? After all, it was just a small symbol and everybody was laughing at him, including the British. But yet he thought he, it would work and it did. So it, it is necessary, I think, to go back to his methods to understand how he understood things, particularly how he understood India, but I think it, it's a large, it goes beyond India, and then see whether any of those methods are relevant to us today. And so part of that exercise, what one would be uh, trying to do today, is to look at its impact, which I think is very critical uh, in our everyday life, and uh, therefore to see how it works on something which is possibly in, I would argue some of the least, one of the least understood concepts that have emerged in recent times, that of post-truth. Right? It has had an impact on the most powerful country in the world, and yet bulk of the reaction to it has remained one of sneakers. Nobody's trying to understand what exactly that is, how did it work, and why, why did it work. And so what I thought we could do is look at Gandhi peace and, and post-truth. But given our concerns with post-truth, I would really be starting in the others, in the reverse order. I'll first look at what we mean by post-truth. I'll then go on to see how the traditional response is to that. Right? When I talk about post-truth, I'll argue that it comes, it has substantial, uh, it, it draws, perhaps unfairly draws uh, in a way that is not valid that is not, uh, I think, basically not ethical, but it still draws from the philosophy of science. And having drawn from the philosophy of science, it goes on to uh, uh, we'll try, and, try and argue that some of the ways philosophy of science would respond to it do not address it, and then I'll try to bring in Gandhi's thought and see if that helps us uh, get a little closer to that. To begin with, post-truth is seen just as the fact that it, uh, it made it as the Oxford uh, word of the year in, in uh, 2016, and it is something that uh, that, so it's, that by itself is not very important, but nevertheless, because after all, every year Oxford has a word of the year. But this particular one, given the political context in which it occurred, gained a great deal of, uh, of interest. And because talking uh, where Oxford dictionaries defined it as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Right? It's essentially seen as a battle against objectivity and objective facts. So there are two elements here that I think we need to take forward, which are built into this definition. First is a clear demarcation between objective facts and personal beliefs as two things that are completely separate and that you can identify each of them very, very differently. Right? This is, uh, goes against the grain in some sense, where you tended to believe in many of the debates that you could change beliefs through facts. Right? In some sense, this makes a clear distinction, saying that the two, uh, two are fundamentally uh, distinguishable and, and, and different. Right? The second thing that is being uh, emphasized here, or is built into this definition, is that personal beliefs can now be used to challenge objective facts. Right? For us in India, uh, this is something that we can make a great deal of noise about and laugh as Trump about. But when uh, our political leadership said that it does not matter whether there is objective proof of whether the Ram Temple existed at Ayodhya or not, it's just a matter of our beliefs and the beliefs have to gain precedence over objective facts, it was in fact an early example of post-truth. And the establishment of it, the fact that the world's, uh, one of the world's most populous countries went fully with that was a recognition that post-truth was a valid means of communicating, uh, communicating an idea, certainly in the political domain. But the responses to post-truth, the way it has occurred, has been to stick entirely to the issue of objective fact versus, versus the beliefs, and to come up with the idea that, this, that anything against an objective fact is essentially lying. This is there in the, in the political domain, and of course it's very difficult for politicians to accuse another of lying, and it's, it's a part of their, uh, of their training. And in fact, so Obama in, his, in, this, in this campaign uh, recently for the midterm elections in the, you know, to the US Congress and Senate, uh, kept emphasizing the, the degrees of lying. 
he kept talking about how it did not really if politicians always lie everyone lies but it never so blatantly never so repeatedly so the whole idea of campaign against post truth did not become one of whether it was right or wrong but just the fact that it was that somehow it had gone out of control within that the scientists have been equally critical of this and i think both the uh, lancet and nature have had editorials uh, targeting this and they too are really uh, by and large within the realm of treating post truth as lying right it's essentially just a different form of lying so sci- like uh, the, in nature uh, a philosopher wrote scientists and philosophers should be shocked by the idea of post truth that they should speak up when scientific findings are ignored by those in power or treated as mere matters of faith right so if you can reduce it to faith at some level you have removed objectivity from the exercise uh, lancet was equally critical he says truth is what we in science and medicine have at the very heart of our enterprise this is uh, i mean that article goes on to discuss feraband's idea of against method he was apparently a student of feraband and there is a celebration of feraband's scientific uh, uh, fle- scientific skills if you like but nevertheless he just ends up calling it charming but nothing that you can take seriously so the essential argument really here is that both for the politicians and for the scientists that post truth is a matter of lying right and that if you it is a, it is a justification uh, justification for lying right but that still leaves the critical question why do people prefer lies right if it is just a lie why is it that it worked so substantially uh, in the american case or equally significantly why is it that it worked even earlier in the indian case right it is no longer as we look at it we look at brexit for instance many of the arguments are similarly the case of the emotions overruling uh, overruling this it's no longer a case of just one individual gone gone uh, one gone rogue right it's no longer a case of just looking at trump and laughing at him or, or taking what what he's saying at a kind of a at, at to mock him out of the table what we're really uh, seeing is is something much more uh, much more strategic right where the whole effort is to look at it as something as a new way of recognizing how i can convince another person right and this really uh, can be seen in terms of two specific stages the first stage is what philosophers would recognize as the demarcation problem that there is an objective truth and a subjective judgment right if you it's put out it can be put out in multiple ways but this is a basic distinction that exists and by continuing to line up on the side of objective truth this current debate has only consolidated this thinking that there is a clear distinction that that should or can can exist between objective truth and and subjective judgment right? the second ele- element is that the that what you have to do in post truth and which trump does repeatedly is essentially you have to overwhelm objectivity with relativism so if you see donald trump's interviews he never just talks about emotions but he first goes in very quietly but very uh, very strongly and repeatedly about how uh, there are multiple options if you talk to him about climate change he say oh that's not decided there's there is a scientists say that climate change is occurring he say there are other scientists who say it's not right so the idea is to convert the objective element into a matter of a debate right and once there is a debate about it for people who don't know there is an equivalence there somehow we say okay these are the two sides in the debate how do i know what is true right and since the technicalities of climate change are 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 very very substantial uh it it you don't find others who would be willing to get into it and and develop an opinion on their own so it's quite uh, it's quite effective to simply say that you talk of one set of scientists i will show you another set of scientists who are saying exactly the opposite thing so in effect you're removing the supremacy of objectivity right this is a process that has already been challenged in the social sciences there are a large number of a uh, large amount of work a large particular in some fields in the social, some disciplines in the social sciences which totally uh, not just contest but uh, fight the idea of objectivity they see it as spurious they see it as something that has that is uh, that that's not quite 
what is real that there are ways of collecting data which uh, which you can which we pretend is objective but is not actually objective and therefore any effort to claim objectivity is quite false right so once you do that it becomes simpler to make a case for relativism so most social sciences uh, while scientists uh, still remain largely by and large uh, sort of committed to an idea of objectivity most social science not most social science but most uh, several disciplines in social sciences uh, are big have challenged objectivity quite substantially and if you are out of it you can slip into fairly high degrees of relativism much of the debate and the equivalence between different sides of the, of the debate on several social issues often de depends on where who you are so you have entire domains in indian social science where uh, where outsiders or people who don't belong to their group that is being studied are are, uh, are not encouraged to join right i mean this is you get a, a dominance of a particular group within that you get women studies are expected to be dominated by women dalit studies are expected to be dominated by dalits you get a certain idea that essentially these things have a subjective element and the subjective element is what we take forward into our into our analysis and any claims to objectivity are spurious and uh, or even if not spurious certainly are exaggerated right, within that okay. so you have this whole, the first step of uh, post truth is really overwhelming objectivity with relativism the second step comes from what i will call the right to belief that my belief is in some sense as important as somebody else's objective facts and this comes uh, as as grown even if it doesn't come from it has grown because of what we can call the tyranny of averages that as an economist we've been brought up to think as if the society is around its average the variations around the average are largely ignored in its crudest form we celebrate growth rates right the variations around that growth rate are largely ignored so we can talk about things like jobless growth with with a great deal of flair and and detail recognizing that what does that mean for the not recognizing that through what that means for the economy if i have a jobless growth as far as employment is concerned i'm talking about a zero growth rate right and then you have the systems of calculating these rates which have gone completely into into technicalities but more than the technicalities into a very substantial degree of error right you can have a poverty line saying that we have 20% of india's uh, population is under the poverty line you have another one which puts it at 40% if you have a 100% margin of error right what is your claim to up to the fairness of objective science of objective facts right you end up challenging those facts moving with it and turning it around so this is and then you're going as you say that okay because of this growth rate i must cut out subsidies i must cut out various other things so you cut out the extremes you cut out the poor from what where, where you're going and in the process as you lose out on the variation the average becomes a tyranny and if you're thrown that figure you tend to respond of course today the government has come up with yet another figure of the gdp which seems to have uh, uh, a lot of political implications but not getting into it, the fact is if you can keep changing the D gdp figures so frequently where exactly uh, what's the objective strength or the lo logic or the depth behind it right so what happens is that when you have this tyranny of averages you have uh, uh, situations like globalization or processes like globalization which generate their own kind of of uh, debates for instance if you have you in the united states itself when uh, bangalore the whole term word bangalore came up it was because there was a certain process where jobs from the us could be done in bangalore and were shifted here but it was done so uh, so insensitively even cruelly like the famous case where one worker in the U us was sacked for a job in bangalore and the last assignment he, that was given to him was to train the people who would do the job in bangalore and uh, he walked out to the parking lot and shot himself that that was uh, one of the elements that led to the emergence of the term bangalore for those who are losing their job but this kind of process then begin to begin to question what does the overall average mean right if if i am an individual loser to a point that i have to take off my life what does it matter if i talk of an overall growth rate 
right? What is, the, what is the nature of my relationship with the overall? What is the individual's relationship with the overall? And how do I react to facts that lay claim to a certain element within that? So if this is the process that we are, what are the lessons we can get to understand this process from the philosophy of science? Can, it has obviously been something that has been very substantially debated. Going back, uh, Sundar is here, so he would correct me if I'm wrong, going back, I think, to Hume and his problem of induction. Right? Essentially, basically, the idea being that uh, if, uh, no matter how many black crows I see, there's always a possibility of a white or a purple crow somewhere, which I've never seen. So verification itself can never be complete. And if verification is never complete, I can never be certain about whatever fact I have and therefore I have a, a problem. I cannot move from the particular to the general. I have a problem of induction within that. Uh, this led to, I think among the many responses, I, I think there are, it's a huge field in itself. But I would like to focus on Popper's response to this, partly because it is the dominant Indian thinking at the moment in, in the sciences, this is directly follows from the use of statistics, the way it's used is probably that. And partly also because I think it follows a perfect uh, parallel to what Gandhi was thinking in many ways, though Gandhi, of course, uh, predates Popper. Right. Uh, so Popper's response is really, if, I, if there's an inadequacy of verification, it leads to the problem of distinguishing or demarcating rational theories and irrational beliefs. Because if I say that nothing can be fully verified, can I just go around with my irrational beliefs? But why should I have a relation, rational belief? Why should I say this theory is better than that? Why should I stick to one theory and, and not another? So his second absolute was that he recognized there that this problem of verification was, was serious enough to ensure that you would never get an absolute truth, right? But it remains the same, right? It's, it remains the aim of science, that we are truth, absolute truth remains our aim and it remains the implicit standard of our criticism, right? It's the norm by which you decide whether something is accepted or not, right? Uh, it must be possible for an empirical scientific system to be refuted by experience. In other words, He's saying that if, falsifiable, if ref, uh, verifiability is not acceptable, we must have a statement that can be refuted by experience. You must have a falsifiable statement. To quote his example from the, uh, from the logic of scientific discovery, he basically talks about if I, I can make a statement saying it will rain today and I will be right or wrong at the end of it, but if I say that it's going to rain or maybe not rain today, it's not a falsifiable statement. It is a statement that you, that doesn't mean very much. And he went on, of course, uh, to see social sciences and that became a critique of Freud uh, as a psychology, and then, of course, Marx and uh, in his famous work, Open Society and Its Enemies. But basically, the point he was making is that you cannot uh, look at it in terms of, of accepting a theory unless it's falsifiable and checking whether it's right. right? Uh, so what happens is then, but then how do I decide what is fine? How do I demarcate between what is rational and what is not rational? Right? And it is here that Popper uh, comes into his uh, own way. He argues that, I, that, is, that what we are seeking is not the truth, is that, but what we may call truth-likeness or verisimilitude of the theories of science, so far as they have stood up to severe criticism, including tests. The fact that you cannot have a perfect test for Popper is not enough as long as there have been, is not enough to reject it, but there is, as long as there are sufficient number of theories checking it, you have it's a sufficient number of tests checking it, you can talk about it as, as, being, as being a fair enough line of demarcation between truth and, and science, uh, and between uh, truth and falsity, between, uh, uh, between what is rational and what is irrational. Now, the philosophers of science, of course, have gone into this in considerable detail, and there is a wide recognition of the imperfection of demarcation. Right? That demarcation, the line demarcating rational from non-rational, is far from perfect. You have the duum quine thesis, which basically argues that any experiment is not just an experiment about the hypothesis, not just a statement about an hypothesis, but it's also a statement about the way the question has been raised. It's also a statement about the, about the equipment used in that experiment, 
all the various elements that you put in. The, uh, an experiment about data, or you take a certain set of data and come to a conclusion. It's a state, the conclusion is not just a statement about what is being tested, it's also about the quality of the data and the way the basic process has been worked. Right? So essentially, therefore, you cannot have a clear element, even with a, with a clear laboratory test, you cannot be certain that that, labor, that is the rational truth. It's possible the experiments were wrong. It's possible the design of the experiment was wrong or the material of it was wrong. More, more uh, uh, frequently, if you like, you could uh, look at statistical tests of significance. Right? You can either have a, a type 1 error where you you reject something that is true, or you can go in for a type 2 error where you accept something that's false. Right? The entire nature of falsification has been such that you have tended to go prefer avoiding the type 2 error, even at the risk of increasing the type 1 error. So you end up saying, I'll get more and more rigorous. Right? So I'll set very stringent conditions for, for rigor. In the process, I might end up rejecting a lot of stuff that's actually true. Right? So if that is a matter of judgment, even if I go in for a test, do I take, what's the degree of level of confidence I take, right? Do I take 5% to 1%? The idea of rigor would suggest you go for 1%, but there's a chance that you're leaving out something that might actually be true. But the point is that it remains a subjective judgment. Whether I go for 5% or 1% still remains a subjective judgment. So it's no object, the demarcation line itself is not objectively defined within that. Right. So, th and Popper himself, uh, there can be no sharp demarcation between science and metaphysics. He recognized that many of the great ideas of science at first come in and uh, built, played a role in, in, uh, uh, in, at first come from metaphysics, right? And therefore, it's not uh, impossible to make that demarcation. But his, the critical point on which his entire method uh, sort of uh, functions is his argument that as to practical actions, I should be ready to base them on the best theory in its field, provided it has been, provided it has been well tested. Right? So you have a clear demarcation. It's, even if the demarcation is not very clear, as long as it's been tested well enough, he's willing to go with it. Now, there are a large number of areas where, of course, that would not happen. And this is particularly in the element of peace, in, in the realm of peace. Now, in peace, or if we take peace in its narrowest definition as the avoidance of conflict, right? We can look at conflict as uh, as the as being based upon two elements. One is the divergence of interest, and the second is when it leads to incompatible actions, right? So you have these two elements there that goes goes into conflict. And now, if I'm going to counter either interest or incompatible actions, I might be in a situation where I do not have sufficient scientific evidence. Right? If I'm dealing with a particular situation which has broken out yesterday, I don't know anything to, about what exactly is there, but I nevertheless have to deal with it. I cannot say I will wait until I have evidence. I cannot take the Popperian view of saying that until such time as I have evidence, I am not justified in doing anything. Right? So when you are doing that, in, a, in, in the element of ease, there is an immediacy of actions. You need to counter incompatible actions. If there is violence breaking out on the street, you do not even know who is involved, may not know the causes, you certainly don't have scientific evidence of why that has happened, but you need to intervene immediately to try and see that that, uh, that, uh, that has uh, not continued. Right? So you cannot always wait for adequately tested theories. Right? So you allow your judgments and very often, unfortunately, your emotions to take over your response and to see how you would respond to that. So you end up with unscientific interventions, interventions that seem easy to make, and violence then becomes an instrument of peace. Right? The fact that the act is violent itself is not taken to be an act of, against peace, but is rather seen as a necessary action for peace. And you find repeatedly uh, in, a, in a variety of areas, where, whether it's Kashmir, whether it's anywhere else, where violence is actively advocated for the development of peace, right, on the grounds that it would bring about peace. And the trouble with that is that you don't quite always know where it is, whether that is true, for the simple reason that violence or violent reactions tend to move towards the individual. You target specific individuals who you think are involved in that process. You don't recognize the larger source of violence. 
Typically, even if you take a security kind of a response, the response is to identify individuals who are troublemakers in some sense and eliminate them. But the very idea of using that violence can generate further violence or groups that feel that that has justified violence and if they can use it, so can we. So you have the kind of process that emerges within that. It's an unscientific intervention, but it is something that's widely believed and widely held, uh, held to be true. All right. Now, it is in this context as to what can you do here that we come to Gandhi and, uh, and his whole response to the immediacy of peace. And his response was finally, was, was primarily to accept that action, for him the world was a series of actions and that you had, in any analysis of a situation, primacy had to be given to action. Right? It was essentially an action that was at the start of it. And in that uh, action, while he went, he, he took the view that reason was, was, must be followed rather than faith, where possible, he was quite willing to use subjectivity in various ways. And he saw subjectivity not as a weaker option, but something that could be used in a way to actually actively de develop a result that you're looking for. So he went into various ways in which you can strengthen, uh, strengthen a person's subjectivity. And one of the major things that he went to was the whole, whole idea of sacrifice, right? He made a distinction between the non-moral and the moral. That the moral would fo follow the morality that exists at a point of time, but the, it would still be non-moral non unless there was a sacrifice associated with it. So if you for accept the existing morality or the rules of morality, you were still non-moral. It's only when you brought in your sacrifice that people took it seriously. And from the sacrifice, that morality got a certain force, right? That people felt he had done. So he used fast as a part of this this process, but he went beyond that. Uh, I mean, he, he was quite clear that he. I mean, he used to keep saying that the fact that he was wearing just uh, a short uh, dhoti, if you like, uh, would would not be uh, meant, would not mean anything if he could not if he could afford to wear nothing else. There are a large number of people who, who at that time did not wear, uh, dressed very differently, but it was not taken as a sacrifice simply because they could not afford, uh, afford to do anything else. So his idea of morality had to be backed by sacrifice. The second thing that he supported and supported very strongly, and this is his, probably one of his more innovative ideas, is that he recognized the power of proximity. That's, he was dealing with a subjective judgment, but he believed that people tended to be closer to those they were, were in their immediate surroundings. In fact, in 1916, he defined Swadeshi as that spirit in us which restricts us to the use and service of our immediate surroundings, to the exclusion of the more remote. He wasn't saying this in a territorial sense. In fact, the statement uh, he made when trying to convince uh, uh, Christian missionaries in Madras uh, against, uh, uh, against conversion. So you're saying this here in a religious sense, in a sense of religious surroundings and immediate religious surroundings. But he's basically recognized that all of us, these were, he's really talking here about intuition and what people tend to be. He's not making a rational argument right? about intuitively we tend to prefer our immediate surroundings or what is there towards uh, over what is more remote. And the third critical element of a subjectivity was non-attachment. That if you are not attached to the, re to the rewards of what you are doing, people would tend to recognize your subjectivity, more, more willing to accept the judgments involved. Whereas if you were attached to the rewards, there would be greater skepticism about what you are doing. And for him then, faith and subjectivity were closely interlinked. Right? And if, uh, so keeping subjectivity out, the Popperian option of keeping subjectivity out was, was not for him. So as far as his, he was concerned, he was believed in, in uh, he has a position actually in some ways not very different from Popper. Right? The first is in our, in, on the issue of absolute truth, he's using the same words and it's virtually identical to Popper's position. Uh, Gandhi argues, in our way, in our endeavor to approach absolute truth, we shall always be content with relative truth from time to time, the relative at each stage being as good as the absolute. Right? Uh, you can see this if you compare this with what Popper is saying. Uh, we believe rightly or wrongly, uh, what we believe rightly or wrongly is not that Newton's theory or Einstein's theory is, tr is true, but they are good approximations to the truth, though capable of being superseded by better ones. So anyway, in that sense, Popper is once again talking about relative truth, in, or what Gandhi would call uh, relative truth. 
Again, Gandhi argues that faith has no place in a sphere in which we can exercise our reason. Faith has meaning only in relation to what is above reason. So he too is recognizing the role of demarcation. Yeah. And uh, Popper responds, I mean, Popper is writing differently in a different in an era, but he comes to a system, an idea that is very similar. Science has at all times been profoundly influenced by metaphysical ideas. Certain metaphysical ideas and problems have dominated the development of science for centuries as regulative ideas, while others have by degrees been uh, turned into scientific theories. Right? But despite these two similar views, their points of Gandhi has some very specific points of departure. Right? The first point of departure is in a weak demarcation. Right? Scientists' response to a weak demarcation is to seek greater rigor. Right? Even if it means it increases the possibility of rejecting a true hypothesis. Right? So for a scientist, objective truth is certain and the only way to develop that or to deal with the demarcation is to reduce the scope for subjectivity. The economists in particular is seen as a pseudoscience and many economists spend all their time trying to convert subjective decisions into, uh, into objective statements. Gary Becker for one converts all decision making in a family into a series of objective uh, models and, uh, and that much of behavioral economics, much of it continues around that same, uh, same set of norms. That ultimately the only way to deal with subjectivity is by reducing it to objective statements or, or, or objective truths. Now, Gandhi's uh, was, was, uh, response was quite different. He says, if there is no sharp objective demarcation between the rational and the irrational, make a judgment about what is it. Right? You, can, you will use your judgment to decide, okay, this line is better than that. This is the point where I think that is more objective. This is the point where it's not. In the practice of science, many scientists have done that. Right? And this is one of the reasons uh, why Einstein was was a great uh, was a great um, uh, I don't know if I should was word fan, but he certainly was someone who strongly supported Gandhi and and uh, had very, very clear uh, points about that. But that comes really from the attitude that ultimately, even in the purest uh, practice of science, you are making judgments about where the line is between the rational and the non-rational. Uh, the, so while the scientists seek to uh, reduction of, of subjectivity, Gandhi emphasized improving the quality of subjectivity. Right? So for him then, the distance from the rewards became important and a close participation with the subject of the study. The famous uh, uh, social sociologist Radha Kamal Mukherjee was studying a slum in, in Delhi and then uh, he went to meet Gandhi. And uh, he told Gandhi about the work and etc. So Gandhi asked him, where are you staying? And he, so he was staying in some other house and visiting the slum every day. And Gandhi told him, but how can you study it? If you don't have the same experience, if you don't share the same experience, you can't possibly share, uh, share what is happening there. So in some sense, it was uh, a prelude to participant, ob or participant observation, if you want to call it that. But for him, you couldn't uh, understand a situation without directly uh, being involved with it. So you needed close participation with the study and distance from the rewards. And you needed both occurring at the same, at the same time in order to work with it. But once it was clear that, sub, that the rational was not available to you for whatever reason, Gandhi was not, uh, not uh, averse to using faith. And the most uh, striking example is what I will call Gandhi's uh, post-truth. Right? Because what he's doing, if you go back to our definition of post-truth, is recognizing that there are certain emotions and other elements that can be used to gain uh, support over objective facts and is willing to use it. And the case that he did was his famous statement in Tirunelveli that the, uh, in 1934 that the fa what emerged from, uh, uh, from the whole element of, uh, of this was the BR earthquake and that the earthquake was God's punishment for untouchability. Right? This got Tagore and other rationalists and scientific thinkers extremely, uh, extremely uh, angry. And Tagore, in fact, wrote, wrote that it has caused me painful surprise to find Mahatma Gandhi accusing those who blindly follow their own social custom of untouchability, of having brought down God's vengeance upon certain parts of Bihar. 
It is all the more unfortunate because this kind of unscientific view of things is too readily accepted by a large section of our countrymen. All right. But Gandhi's response to this was equally energetic and angry. I mean, he published Tagore's letter in, in Harijan and immediately uh, wrote his own response. And his response really is to say that I cannot get the element of objective truth, therefore I am entitled to use the subjective. But this has certain uh, elements that are important. He says, I cannot prove the connection of the sin of untouchability with the Bihar visitation, even though the connection is instinctively felt by me. If my belief turns out ill-founded, it will still have done good to me and those who believe with me. For we shall have been spurred to more vigorous efforts towards self-purification, assuming, of course, that untouchability is a deadly sin. Right. So what we are doing here now is he recognizes the demarcation and what is to be done if that science is not enough to convince me as to why it happened there, did not happen anywhere else, what is the precise, precise point where that happens. But in doing so, he is identifying certain methods of evaluating post-truths. The first is consequentialism, which is a major element right through uh, Gandhi's thinking, right? where he talks of the consequences of allowing subjectivity to make up for what is not known objectively. Right? So he's willing to say that if I'm judging whether my, my demarcation between rational and irrational was right, what is the consequence of my judgment? The consequence of my judgment, if that is positive, it does not matter. Right? So when I'm making an uncertain demarcation, the relevant line is what happens if I'm wrong. Right? And his argument here is even if he's wrong, it would actually strengthen the movement against untouchability. Right? The second element that is critical in this demarcation is to avoid expediency. Right? Do we, when we are making a demarcation between the rational and the non-rational, tend to support what we want to believe? If I'm doing an, a research project and I've made up my mind that these are the conclusions that will suit what I'm thinking, do I play around with my uh, degrees of significance in a way that the data will suit what I'm saying? Right? Is there an expediency in making the judgment about the, uh, about the uh, demarcation? Right? And uh, in order to avoid expediency, there must be per no personal rewards from the user subjectivity. And there should be an association with those who lose out from that, from that judgment. Right? So there is then a need uh, to challenge the quality and intentions of subjectivity rather than subjectivity itself. Right? So I'll go back in the end, uh, before closing, just to look at, at the direct comparison between Gandhi's use of what we can call post-truth in the Oxford Dictionary sense of the term, and Donald Trump's use of that. Right? First, both are very, are very uh, sensitive to the consequences, but the nature of the consequences are fundamentally different. Right? For Trump, the consequence, when he's catering to a view of those who have been hurt by globalization, he's mobilizing them. And in mobilizing them, he's taking on the entire intellectual elite, both by what he says and how he says it. Right? And he's, uh, he's encouraging those who have lost out from globalization to actually challenge, uh, challenge what is now the dominant uh, rhetoric of the period. So it is in his interest to mock Obama, to mock, uh, uh, to mock scientists, to mock the whole lot by, by functioning with trying to support, gain support of those who are lost out to the elite before. Right? That's quite different from what Gandhi would argue that when the net result or the consequence of what you're doing, consequence of your doubt, what, how would you evaluate that? And if you're going to evaluate it by saying it's just a narrow political end, then it would go against the second set of things that you would argue it would then become expedient. There would be a personal reward from it. Right? So the way to look at post-truth in, in the current context, I would say, it is an assertion, an aggressive assertion by those who have been victims of the tyranny of averages. Right? You have used average growth rates, you have used a larger argument, as if anybody on the fringes of that argument who are losing out from that argument can be dismissed. Right? And you have used it uh, in a way that's quite brutal, with uh, whether it's a question of the killings on, on, uh, I, uh, that followed what happened in Ayodhya, or whether it's a question of, of removing subsidies for the poor. When you're looking at a larger argument based entirely on, on uh, 
uh, on averages you, and leaving out the people who have lost out in the extreme, you're creating a great deal of, of, uh, of pressure. So I would uh, argue that the problem with post-truth is not that there is a subjective element in it, or even that subjectivity is allowed to play a very prominent role in it. The problem is post-truth is that when subjectivity is used experientially, is used for very narrow, very limited goals, wherever it might occur, and that becomes our, our, our crisis point rather than attacking the role of subjectivity itself. Thank you.